Yankees Files podcast. We are back. I'm Will Harris. You're Alec Whipple. Back from not the dead, but from a one week hiatus during which uh, Joey at DJL MVP on Twitter, member of the Crosstown Sports family, did a phenomenal job filling in for you. And the rest of you are fans of the best team in baseball, the team that is best in the American League at creating runs, the team that is best in baseball at preventing runs, the team that is projected to win more games than any other team in all of Major League Baseball by Picota and maybe the Fangraphs playoff odds too? Yup, confirmed. Those are, of course, the first place New York Yankees. Of course, they're in first place. They're the best team in baseball. Whipple, it's a great time to be a fan of the Yankees, especially since we found out that in spite of getting hit in the hand last night by a pitch from Albert Suarez, Aaron Judge is fine. We have a ton to get into on this second consecutive midweek episode of Yankees Files. But first, how are you? I'm glad to have my job back. I feel like there was a really big chance I could have gotten uh, Wally pipped here. And, uh, exactly. you know, I'm, I'm here. Did I'm not back. Start his Lou Gehrig streak. This is if Wally Pip came back and displaced Lou Gehrig and was one of the great players of Yankees history. So. <laughs> I'm glad that uh, that you know Joey's great, and I think he would probably do a better job than I do. But you all are stuck oh, with me, and I'm glad kind. glad to make it back. I'm glad to be back talking with you. We definitely have a lot to talk about um, about Yankees, about our own experiences, about the fact that we're recording this less than an hour before Garrett Cole returns to the Yankees, which is it like is a, a big day to be Alec Whipple. It, it is. I kind of like the midweek episode because I feel like. It's like instead of, you know, talking between episodes of a TV show, it's like we're dropped right into the episode. We're in the middle of the action. Uh, the but the vibes are good. Like you said, I think the Aaron Judge scare had everyone worried. I don't Definitely. think we've, we've recorded since the Juan Soto scare. And we, the also, two of us, have not. That's we, true. Sorry, I have not talked about how we emotionally, how I emotionally processed, how we processed that last weekend. And I think given that... The first scare, the Garrett Cole scare, is 99.5% resolved, given, you know, he, him stepping on a mound in an hour. I, I think it's just, you know, it's the, the vibes are good. The, the things that usually go poorly are going right for the Yankees and just luck. And the things that the Yankees usually do well, hit home runs, pitch well, win games, they're doing well. Like, it's just all, all things are good right now. And um, I know that... It's a big series right now against the Orioles. But in spite of the fact that the Orioles took three out of four against the Yankees, I feel like the narrative that we discussed, or sorry, took three out of four last month, the narrative we discussed of the Yankees feeling like they're trying to catch the Orioles, I, I feel like I don't feel that as much right now. Especially yeah, I think given, what happened, given what happened with Judge last night, it definitely felt like one team was trying to get under the skin of another team. And it was not the Yankees trying to get under the skin of the Orioles. So. It's a long season, but right now it feels like the Yankees are in pole position, both in the standings and I think in just the, you know, the relationship, the back and forth with the Orioles. And that's good. What do you think? What do you think Wally Pipp's career fan graphs war is? (laughs) Is it even possible? This is such an impossible question. It is positive. (laughs) Like 2.3. It's (laughs) 31.6. Oh, he was like, okay. I actually just didn't realize he was a good player for that long, but yeah. So Wally Pipp. Uh, in his full seasons with the Yankees, which spanned from 1915 to 1924, was worth 28.6 Fangraphs war. He had uh, a solid enough season in Cincinnati after uh, after leaving the Yankees. Anyway, that was an impossible question. One of my friends texted in a group chat. I can't remember if it was today or yesterday, asking what we think Ryan Braun's career war is. And I'd like to hear what what you estimate because I was way off. Oh, it's got to be good, like forty five. Holy cow! Okay, so you're really close. I think on Fangraphs it's forty three point eight. Yeah, he was uh, good. Let me good for a long let me time. confirm that. I, so I had completely lost touch with yeah forty three point eight on Fangraphs. So you were extremely close. I completely lost touch with how long his peak lasted. Like mm-hmm. his first season eclipsing four war 
was the first season in which he played over 150 games. Mm -hmm. And then from then, which was 2008 through 2012, his worst season was 3.7 war. He went four and a half, five, 3.7, 7.1, 6.8. That's 27.2 right there. And I basically, I guess like 25 or something because I basically thought he did nothing outside of that. But then over the rest of his career from 2013 to 2020, he put up 14 more uh, and he had a two and a half war season as a rookie and a not quite full season. He had 34 home runs in 113 games in 2007. I have no recollection of him being that good that fast or staying serviceable uh, or even good for as long as he did. So anyway, I sorry, remember Ryan, that. Ron. I remember that because I remember he was playing out of position. Like he, I think he was the third baseman and his negative defensive war was like really bad. Like, Oh really yeah. Bad. So yeah, in 2007, he played 113 games, 112 of them were at third base and then he never played third base again. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. It was, um, that's crazy. It, it was really good for a long time. So anyway, good for you, Ryan Braun. And uh, we're very sorry about the unfortunate uh, situation with the guy handling the, your the uh, steroid testing <laughs> sample. We don't have to get into that. We don't. We don't want to touch that. Free my guy, the collector. He did free, nothing wrong. He did collector. nothing. <laughs> I like how oh we said we're going to keep this like tight, and we've just not even. If people yet. if people get that reference, do you think people, people are going to get that collector. reference? I hope that was pretty mainstream ten years ago. The collector who got what? Wait, wasn't it? Didn't Ron say it was like anti-Semitic against the he, collector? He did, and that's the yeah. thing I was trying to avoid because I don't want to yeah, dip my okay. toe into into that. Anyway, Ryan Braun, uh, I'd use a Hall of Fame vote on you if I had five hundred of them. Um, anyway, anyway, I think we should start with the Garrett Cole sized elephant in the room, which is Garrett Cole is back. He's starting against the Orioles tonight before any of you hear this podcast, because this podcast will probably end around the time that he takes the mound. Whipple, there's a lot we can get into there. You know, you take the team with the best record in baseball and you add the reigning Cy Young winner. That's one angle on this. I think the way I look at it is... The Yankees have played 75 games. So we would have expected Garrett Cole to start 15 of those, right? Right. And I think there's there's someone on Twitter, and I'm sorry if you're listening to this and I don't credit you properly, who I think has been doing the accounting of what would the Yankees record be in games, or what is the Yankees record in games that Garrett Cole would have started. And I think he had them at six and nine. But the bottom line is the Yankees have 27 more wins than losses at this point. What my question to you is, uh, and they're up two and a half games in the division. My question to you is, what's the worst record the Yankees could have had without Garrett Cole that you still would have found acceptable? Because I know it's a lot worse than 51 and 24. And I'm astonished that they've been this good in his absence. And I think, you know, not all of the pitching performance that they've gotten has been just true talent, elite run prevention. But as we've said, this whole season, those wins count. Garrett Cole is coming into a much better situation than I think either of us expected. What's the worst acceptable situation you, you can imagine? What would you have been happy with through 75 games given Cole's absence? I think I would have been happy with being, I mean, this is such, it's such an arbitrary question, but I think being in this series against the Orioles well, right now. Well, let me now, make it more specific. Okay. Let me make it more specific. The Baltimore Orioles are 47 and 25. The Yankees are 51 and 24. So the Orioles have only played, what is that? 72 games. Would you have taken, uh, would you have taken worse than 45 and 30 in Cole's absence? Probably, I I, prob that, I think that's like the line I was trying to find. Like, I think for me, what I judge is like... 40 and 35? Know, that probably is too low. I, I would judge it as, I would want the Yankees to be playing a series against the Orioles in June, where if they swept that series, they would be 
very close to the Orioles. If it was like a seven okay. to eight game gap, I think that would be disappointing. If it was like a three to four game gap right now, I think I would understand. I would, so you know, you're in like the 43 and 32. Yeah, yeah I think yeah. so. I, I think that I would want to feel like these games were not just like digging out of the hole because that's kind of what happened last year. And yep. I just don't know if the Orioles are that kind of team that's going to fall apart to allow the Yankees to get back into it. So yeah, yeah I, I think, think in the are. range where you felt like any series you could make headway by winning like two out of three or sweeping and that, you know, the Yankees are not in that position is a really big credit to the guys on the mound and on the team right now. Yeah. I mean, what an incredible 75 games is not an insignificant portion of the season. And I mean, right. To... Let's flash back to how we felt in that moment. Oh my gosh. See, 75 gate minus 75 games and minus the spring training ago. Like there is no way we thought this was the outcome. No, I mean, I remember I was in Florida. I was in my parents' kitchen and I saw either the tweet or the text from you about the tweet. And I was just like, that's it. Like, you know, in spite of adding Soto and adding Stroman and my confidence about Rodon and everything about the offseason and judges' health and whatever, in spite of all of that, to be going into the season thinking, well, you know, see in 2026, maybe Garrett right. Cole coming off 82 and 80. That was brutal. Right. And I'm I never expected that even without Cole, the Yankees were going to be, you know, scrapping to be a 500 team again. But I certainly never expected that without Cole, they would be the best or they would have their best record in baseball. I mean, yeah. that was not that was not remotely in my brain. And it's uh, an incredible credit to Luis Heal, to Clark Schmidt, and to Nestor Cortez, I think, in particular. Like, Carlos Rodon has... Uh, his results have been quite good. Um, I think there are some concerns there. But, like, when you want to talk about just all-around elite performance, it's Nestor, it's Heal, and it's Schmidt. And it really sucks that... Clark Schmidt's going to be unavailable for a while, but what an incredible job those guys did in Cole's yeah. absence. And one thing you've highlighted on the podcast before is it's not just that they've done an incredible job preventing runs. It's that they've done a far better job than we expected eating innings. Mm -hmm. And to have those guys make that kind of contribution and then pass off, you know, pass the baton to a guy who rolls out of bed and pitches 200 innings a year. And now that guy is only going to have to make, I don't know, what, 18 starts, if that? Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I understand Cole's still getting built up, but maybe there's an upside to a Garrett Cole who doesn't debut until it's almost July. Right. Like, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Maybe, maybe he's got some bullets left that he normally wouldn't come September and October. And I just, yeah, as I don't, I don't want to distract from the point, which is what an incredible job that the starting rotation has done in Cole's absence to hold the fort and put the Yankees in the position that they're in. Because I think we all expected to be adding Cole to a team that really needed him. And instead we're adding Cole to a team that is just going to make the rest of the league even more scared of them. And that is a phenomenal position to be in. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't agree more. Like I think, and in particular, like, I mean, I think Luis heel is the the guy to give all of the credit to or 90%. I mean, he's starting the, the all-star game right now. What, isn't he? Right. I mean, basically right. Like best ER in the league, like top of the ranks of all the categories. And for me, like, I will think back always to being in Tampa at that moment when we were texting and I was yeah. going to the game. I think he was scheduled. To, I think he was scheduled to pitch the next day. And the day before, like we got there, it was so fun going to Steinberg Field. I was going to Philly or Clearwater. And then I got that text and it was like, your world is over. And like, yeah. you're, and I mean, my, like, you know, I want to look at this in my perspective because I'm the most important person and this is my favorite. You're the protagonist player. of reality. 
And I, this is the guy I have like staked my reputation on and consistently I'm right about. Like I actually, since I'm sitting here, hold on. This is, you never know what's going to happen on a, on a show that's being recorded live. Sorry. I, I went to Yankee stadium and I saw this magnet there last a few weeks ago and I got oh, it. Hell it, yeah. shows, it shows I'm right. I was right about this. Like I'm right. never going to forget that. But the, the moral and I got is, this signed Jake Bowers card from you were Mr. Right. Name That Yank at Name That Yank because I was right. At this point, uh, this was produced after the 2018 season. Jake, but you know, oh, that's that's his minor league stats. Holy cow. Jake Bowers had done like basically nothing at the major league level at this point. Shout out to, to Name That Yank on Twitter at Name That Yank. Anyway, Jake Bowers was like the quad A player. Love rake barrels traded for but, Yandy Diaz. But I showed up, I showed up to Clearwater and I was like scrolling on my phone, like every two seconds, like what's yeah. going to happen. And for most of the next two games, I actually was doing that. And in retrospect, I felt kind of bad about that, but like we were all so freaked out and I barely noticed. And then I started to notice as Luis heel got on the mound, came out of the bullpen, four innings, scoreless eight strikeouts. And that's the game that, Boone, because Boone was managing that game. That's the game he cites. That's the game Matt Blake cites is when he started to get back on their map because he had been optioned to minor league camp. And I think like the fact that those happened on the same days is like really one of those like cool baseball inflection points. That is see crazy where that you were out. there. Like that. That that would yeah. That's that's actually insane. I hadn't thought a lot about uh the the fact that those two things were so close in time it was yeah i mean it's that is that is baseball season because that was the beginning of what we're watching now is i, I mean i don't know what Luis heel ends up season wise but all-star definitely science games at this point, definitely and Rookie of the it, year maybe it really i mean he knew he knew at that point what had happened like he knew what was on the line stepping on that mound and i think that's pretty cool so nestor definitely Clark definitely, but I think Luis Hill is the guy like where he was in that moment in time and where he is now. It's pretty crazy. And if you look at, I mean, you know, I could read off stat lines and you wouldn't be able to tell me if they're from Cole's 2023 Cy Young season or Heels current yeah. season. Like, and that's not an exaggeration. I mean, he is no, just having a season. I mean, he just May was like the the best month that any Yankee pitcher had ever had, basically, for Luis Hill. Like, that's it's ridiculous. Remember when uh, people were saying Garrett Cole's going to avoid Tommy John surgery for now. Like everyone was putting for now in the sentence. That yeah. was like, as if we weren't stressed enough that people had right. to say Cole will avoid elbow surgery for now. I remember I tweeted something like everything is for now. Like the yeah. sun rises in the East for now. <laughs> right. They're not, they're, gonna, they're not going to operate on a healthy elbow. Although yeah. he is the one guy like who went to Ella trash in LA and came out alive. I, I, that's true. Was, I remember saying like, if he gets hurt, like I'm never going to trust a pitcher again. Yeah. And I mean, obviously especially he got hurt, after but... what you went through with Tanaka. Yeah. And that like that I mean, was a that felt like it was a time bomb. Well, obviously he had the actual injury shortly after he came over, but then it felt right. like it was a time bomb the right. rest of his time. And having to watch Garrett Cole's career like that would right. be a disservice to Garrett Cole, just as it was a disservice to Tanaka. And a disservice to me as a fan. A disservice this is why to exactly. I gotta find a new I don't care what kind of list you're making. I love me. I gotta stop liking pitchers. Like maybe next time I'll, yeah. I'll pick a position player because like it's very I mean, not that your favorite player, you know, have gone like without controversy, but the 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 pitcher as favorite player definitely has its share of stresses. Um, but he's back and hopefully, hopefully by the time we're listening to this. He'll have pitched a complete game shutout on his 70 pitch count. <laughs> so one of your bold predictions at the beginning of the year was that right. he would get Cy Young votes, right? I mean, we're going to see. I, I think it is still very possible. So look at the Cy Young leaderboard. Pull it up. Let's see. <laughs> right. Luis Hill. Well, was... We're talking about Luis Hill. Luis Hill's like going to go to the bullpen in like September. So he's so... gone. Tanner so... Howe's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, of all awesome. these. Done. 
<laughs> Cut. So, uh, Seth Lugo. You expect me to believe that 18 starts of Garrett Cole is going to be worse than Seth Lugo? <laughs> um, rest of season projection from Steamer for Garrett Cole, which I think is the most pessimistic or least optimistic, depending on how you want to do this. I'm going to, you're just going to do these as over unders. Okay. 13 starts. Over. Five wins. Oh, like, like the, not war, like wins. Wit, like pitcher wins. I think over slightly. 79 innings. Over. 9.97 strikeouts per nine, keeping in mind he was at 9.56 last year and 11.53 the year before. I, I think, I think under, um, if you just the based on the way last year was trending, I'd be comfortable saying under 2.23 walks per nine. It was 2.07 last year and 2.24 in 2022. I'm going to say under 3.54 ERA. So under, definitely. 3.55 FIP. Under. 1.3 Fangraphs War. Over. I think I agree with all of those. I think I think if he can make 15 or 16 starts, like, this is just one of those situations. Obviously, sometimes guys in their 30s get injured and they come back and they're never the same. And there is... Somewhere on the bell curve of outcomes for Garrett Cole is that. And that's terrible. And it would be awful and it would make me really sad. But I'm not believing that that's what's going to happen until I know that Garrett Cole isn't Garrett Cole anymore. And as far as I know, Garrett Cole's still Garrett Cole. So I'm with you on all of those and I'm excited about him being back. Let me just read the top 10 pitchers in American League Fangraph 4. And again, my prediction was Cy Young votes, not winning the Cy Young, which yeah. I did kind of think about. And then I was like, <laughs> I don't want to be wrong. Because um, I think Tarek Skubal is a very good pitcher. And I think they're, you know, Corbin Burns is in the league and there's other good pitchers. But Tanner Houck, Tarek Skubal, Garrett Crochet, Cole Reagans, Corbin Burns, Jack Flaherty, George Kirby, Eric Fetty, Luis Heal, Seth Lugo. Like, I believe the Mariners pitchers will be very good. I think Burns mm -hmm. will be good. I think Scooble will be good. But I just feel like there's enough frauds on that list to make me think that Garrett Cole will be able to get back in the conversation. I don't know. Don't talk about Cole Reagans that way. Okay. Don't talk I, about Garrett Cole Reagans that way. Eric Fetty of the Chicago White Sox, who aren't even Eric a real Fetty team. Fetty WAP. <laughs> I mean, I'd love talking about Cole this long, but, you know. We'll do, you, do you think Eric Fetty's ERA is going to end up being 17.38? <laughs> if this prediction is to come true, yeah, rest of season. Let's hope or maybe 6.79. <laughs> yeah. I got to stop. Think, oh, American League that, pitchers. It's not worth. It actually makes me scared of the Seattle Mariners, though. So looking at this leaderboard. Do you, are you going to rewrite the old man in the sea and you're going to say you you fear the Mariners of Seattle? Of Seattle. Yeah, fear it, Luis not the, not the Tigers of Detroit or the Indians of Cleveland, now Guardians. Do you Guardians. think they need to republish the old man in the sea? Updated edition. It's just nothing is changed but that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm oh about my it. Gosh. That's a million dollar idea. And then you sell it to like schools. Yeah. This is a million dollar idea. We should do this. We shouldn't publish like this Taylor, podcast. Nobody like steal what, this. It's like what Taylor Swift does when she re-releases her all her albums with like one new song. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you watch how you talk about Taylor's okay. version. There are different motivations for that. <laughs> anyway, um, shout out Taylor Swift. See you in October. Any of our listeners who are going to be at the Taylor Swift Miami show, I forget which night. See you there. Um, Elena Whipple, hello. Talking about Taylor Swift. <laughs> she says, see you in London because she'll be there. Well, I won't be. Anyway, um, you were at the Cody Poteet game. I was. I caught two baseballs at the Cody Poteet game. You got to talk about this because we've both been to a lot of baseball games. A lot of baseball games. Yeah. And uh, I think I've gotten one ball. It was hit in batting practice by the Tampa Bay 
Devil Rays at the time uh, at the first Yankee game that I ever went to. You had two balls thrown to you by Major League Baseball players mm -hmm. in, in, in the span game. of what, like an hour and a half? And, and given that I've lived on this earth for 27 and a half years and I've not even come close, like people who know me like you and maybe other people I know, know that I was, I was always a taller kid. Like I was a big guy. And even when I was a younger kid, I always looked older than the people surrounding. Like nobody ever, no baseball player ever targeted me and said, I want to throw that kid a ball because he looks young and, and childlike and full of innocence and all the, the good stuff. I, I looked old. I was never getting any balls. My brother yeah. always got, he got tons of baseballs compared to me. Uh, David Robertson threw him a baseball in 2009 World Series. Like, the Angels yeah. third base coach threw him one once. I was always standing next to him. I never got one. So I did not expect to get any, but I was sitting in the bleachers and bleachers are often a prime spot for it. Pre-game is in the outfield. I was watching Shohei Otani do pitching rehab, which was kind of funky. Yeah, that and was interesting. Gavin Stone picked up a ball. I couldn't see who hit it. And I was kind of standing beyond the like berm above the bullpen at Yankee Stadium in left field. And he looked at me, he threw it to me. It was super cool. Like that alone would have been awesome. I was like, I was psyched. I texted you. I texted a bunch of people. First time in my life. If it ended there, that would have been crazy enough. But in it the fifth not. inning, in the fifth inning, when during the game, when Judge and Grisham are doing mid inning throws, Judge turns, uncorks it into 202, bounced over my head off of the bleacher. And basically, like, I didn't die for it. Like, I didn't, I was in a fight or anything. It just went right into my hands. And I like insane. turned and looked at my friend. I was like, what is going on? And everyone like looked at me and I like, I knew the wolves were going to come out because there was like some little kids there. Yeah. So I, I turned and I gave the first one to a girl and her dad next to me. Nice. And I'm so glad I thought of that in the moment. Uh, but I kept the second one. And so I got the good karma of giving one away. Good and job. I got to keep one actually. <laughs> Another show and tell. There we go. So to fill some time while Whipple is out retrieving this baseball, I'll point out that Gavin Stone then pitched the Yankee game that I attended. And while he did give up a home run to Aaron Judge, he did not allow the Yankees to win. And I think that offsets any good karma that he earned from throwing Whipple a ball that he has since given away. Whipple, what, is it, what does it say on that ball? So we're talking about practice. We're talking about practice, not a game. Not the game that I go out there and die for. Good. Play every game like it's my last. People practice. wanted to take pictures with me, like and the or not with me, with the ball. Well, people people want to take pictures with you. Let's be yeah. honest. Somebody yeah. yelled at me to give this one up, and everyone was like, oh, "Come on!" But That's I mean, super cool, once in a lifetime. The game was crazy. I mean, I'd love to hear your Dodgers game experience. I know the yeah. game didn't end up that well for me. It was like playoff baseball in October. I know yeah. that game was kind of designed for it, but like people were on their feet the whole time. I mean, every yep. inning was so intense. Um, and I, I wish the Yankees had scored more than one run at the end. Cause I think the place was ready to burst. Yeah. Uh, but like, there was just some big moments, uh, definitely pitching moments that were just awesome. And it was, it, it had the feel of like, you know, these are really two teams that do not deserve to lose. It was really whichever one stumbled first. And it was just one of those games you leave and you're like, you know what? Like that was good baseball. I don't really care that the team I saw lost because um, it, it was just, just one of those games. You're like, really neither of these teams deserve to lose, but I had so much fun. It was definitely, it lived up to the hype. I wish Juan Soto had pinch hit, but yeah. Stay la vie. I, what was your experience like? Yeah. I mean, I definitely think aside from the playoff game that I attended, is this true? Yeah, I would say aside from the playoff game that I attended, it was the most electric atmosphere at Yankee Stadium that I've ever experienced. I do think that it was a shame that there were so many Dodgers fans. You had uh, the game with all the Dodgers fans. Like, I thought there was a lot on the subway, but then I saw the pictures from your game and I was like, what? The, what? It was, I'd never seen anything like it at Yankee Stadium. They traveled extremely well. Our section was crawling with them. It was really, really surprising that there were so many and they were loud. And for much of the game, the Dodgers were kind of the team that was doing better. And that was annoying because it didn't encourage them to shut up. <laughs> and 
yeah, it was, it was really cool. It was really cool that people were so excited for a game that was being played in the middle of June. You know, you don't get that very often or in the beginning of June. Um, and I was glad that I got to be there for it. And I felt vindicated that the guy for whom I've been beating the drum was the guy who beat the hell out of the Yankees. And that is, of course, Teoscar Hernandez. But it was unfortunate that it went the way it did. You know, um, Nestor didn't pitch terribly. The offense really didn't take advantage of a number of opportunities it had. Of course, Glaber made a pivotal error, which was really unfortunate. Although, I don't know that they were getting either runner. Like, on that play, it certainly didn't look, from my perspective, like they were going to be able to get Mookie at second, and then Otani's very fast, so I don't know. But And it sucked that Canely gave up the Grand Slam, but it was a really cool game to attend, and I look forward to going to games in which the Yankees are more successful shortly. And you saw Teoscar on Madison Avenue? Was that... Yeah, so the next day, I was walking around, um, and maybe I'd just gotten a smoothie or something, and... I'm walking on Madison between 50th and 51st, which is, of course, where the Palace Hotel is. And there's this big crowd on the sidewalk. And I'm kind of like zoned out. And I don't know. It didn't like occur to me what was unifying this crowd or why they're all together or whatever. And I walk by the gate of the hotel and there are these two buses parked on the sidewalk. And I'm like, what is this like a tour? Like what's what's going on here? Like or is this some sort of celebrity people are looking for? And as I walk past the gate, out is walking Teoscar Hernandez talking to someone. I don't know if it's team personnel, security, whatever, to get on the bus. And I look over at him and I'm like, that's Teoscar Hernandez. <laughs> and I thought, like, should I stop for a picture? Should I say something to him? And then I was like, no, because I realized all the people in the crowd were Dodgers fans and it felt wrong to like jump the line and be like, Oh, just cause I'm walking by at this moment, I get to talk to Teoscar Hernandez. But anyway, um, yeah, I just like just cross paths with him the next day, which is kind of funny. Should have said, I wanted you for my team. Yeah. I should have said, I'll trade you Alex Verdugo for you. <laughs> cause I, I mean, that, that's pretty cool. Fun, fun weekend. Um, no matter was, the result, it was, a good weekend. It was, it was definitely, good. Sh it shook up, I think a normal summer baseball weekend and glad 100%. I got to go. Also, Yamamoto is kind of that guy. I mean, I know he's hurt. Yamamoto is that guy. He's really good. I was he's so really ready good. to hate. And I was like, I just, it's, he was so good. He's, he's just a good, he's just a good pitcher. Like yeah. it, it makes sense that the Yankees wanted him. It makes sense that they wanted to pay him a bunch of money. He's very good at getting batters out. Like that's yeah. what it comes down to. Yeah. Um, Whipple, after that, the Yankees played a good series against the Royals in which they won a bunch of games and then lost on some BABIP. And then they played a bad series against the Red Sox in which they won a good game and then lost on some poor run prevention. I don't really want to dive into either of those that much. They came out of it with the best record in baseball and then they took a game against the Orioles. I think in... They've held the Orioles. They obviously had the game where they gave up a bunch of runs in the fourth game in Baltimore. I think aside from that, they've held the Orioles to an average of two runs per game, which like, yeah. if I'm the Orioles, I'm not feeling like, oh, because I'm, what are they, three and two? Like, oh, I got the Yankees number. Like, I'm certainly not feeling that way. Um, and every game in Baltimore, like people didn't really want to address it like this at the time because the Yankees came out on the other side. But when you lose games like two nothing, or you win games two nothing, or you're that close, like those are not it tells indicative. you nothing. Yeah, it tells it's you nothing. Two good teams, and it could go either way. It's like the Dodgers Yankees. You know, if it's like two to one in eleven innings, I don't feel like the Dodgers were the better team based off that game. So yeah, Joey and I were talking yeah. about that. Like the fact that all the Yankees had to do was score in the tenth inning, and then they win the series, and now people want to draw conclusions based on them losing the series. Like it feels a little ridiculous to me. Right. So. I think given, um, you know, you given the Royal Series, stuff happens at Fenway. They won the first game against Baltimore. I, I mean, you know, there's there's bad outcomes. There's good outcomes. I think this is on the good outcome side in, in terms of overall record. We got to talk about Ben Rice, though, before we, we run out of time. I mean, yeah. So Rice Rice Baby is the story of the day. Ben Rice got called up to replace Anthony Rizzo, who I think just got moved to the 60 day in the corresponding move for 
taking Cole off of the 60 day, needing a 40 man spot. Ben Rice has been absolutely raking in the minors. Uh, between double A AA and triple A this year, he was hitting 275, 393, 532 for a 925 OPS. He had 15 home runs and 12 doubles in just 60 games. Ben Rice has been phenomenal at every level of the minors in the last few years. He really started to put things together in Tampa in 2022. He was in the 2021 draft class. And then he just mashed ever since. He was phenomenal last year. His OPS was over 1,000 uh, at every level combined. Uh, funny enough, his lowest OPS last year was at low A. This guy played... 10 games at low A last year, and he's in the major leagues. Um, he played 49 games in Somerset this year and then 11 in Scranton, where he was absolutely mashing 333, 440, 619. And then the Yankees called him up, and I'm excited about what he can do. He has, you know, he's got the on-base tool. He's got the power. He is a little bit older. He played college ball you know, that shifts the development curve a little bit. But I really believe that this is a guy who can come up and make an impact. I know Ryan Garcia was tracking, um, was tracking the highest projected WRC plus for players who had not yet made their major league debut. And Ben Rice was, of course, the highest on the list. Rest of season projections, Fangraph's depth charts has them at 115, WRC plus zips at 116. The rest have him closer to league average. I don't know if we'll see him catch at all. It seems like he's going to be a viable solution at first base, but I just could not be more excited about <clears throat> seeing him get a chance. And it would really change things for the Yankees if he can viably hold down that first base corner spot because right now I think there are a lot of people thinking the Yankees need two infielders or even three infielders at the trade deadline and I just don't buy that and I'm pretty confident in Ben Rice's ability to make sure that that doesn't need to happen and I mean the one thing you got to say about the whole situation is just Rice Rice baby wasn't there like some some photo of Peraza in New York city that got posted and everyone thought that, yeah, he was at like the empire state building observation deck or something. Yeah. I think that that is good that it, that did not happen. Yeah. I think there's a world like maybe, a, you know, different motivations. The Yankees have a different record. There's less urgency. There's more urgency. I don't, I don't know like what the, what would it take for Peraza to get called up or for it to be Cabrera and LeMahieu as the solution, but I'm glad the Yankees did the, not, I don't think aggressive thing because he's hitting really well, but just keeping the faith in the young guys yeah. that they've, they've been placing in the last calendar year. And, and given it's worked that well it, in that time. It's worked really well. I mean, Austin Wells and Anthony Volpe have been a net positive for this team. And I think Ben Rice can join them. I think given, you know, his strikeout walk rates, the way he's hitting in double and triple A, like you said, like his kind of, he's older, but like he got off to a late start developmentally. I, he does all the things that the Yankees look for. And the fact that he plays first base is it, it just is a really perfect fit. I don't know what we would have been saying about Anthony Rizzo at this point if he was playing for another week, but it just I think we hope he there. feels better. I think we yeah. hope he feels better, he recovers, and he is ready to make an impact for the team when he's healthy. I, I think he will make an impact for the team, but I think if Ben Rice hits there is a place for both of them on this team. And sure. I hope that's the case. I hope we're not desperately looking for a first baseman at the deadline. Yeah. Looking is different, but desperately, you know, hopefully Ben Rice making a desperate move little. would be a shame. Yeah. So Anthony Rizzo, uh, you know, having him out and having someone like Rice to fill that gap is it's just a credit to the Yankees. I think it's a greater though. luxury than people realize. Definitely. We we've said it a lot in the last year, but the Yankees have a really good farm system and they produced a lot of quality players in the last year, two years. Um, and we're seeing the fruits of a minor league system overhaul that started in 2019. And I think some people wanted results in 2019, but given the current crop of guys, I, you really have to be happy with 
the both the top line prospects, but then guys like Rice who coming out of nowhere and making this kind of impact. I mean, him just being able to play with the Yankees is already a developmental success. So Absolutely. I'm excited to see what he, he does. He looks like he's having a blast. Like he does. Which is, at, isn't that so, so much fun? Like he has yeah. the Oswaldo Cabrera factor where you almost can put aside the quality of his play just because he is so happy to be a Yankee. He is so happy to be in the big leagues. He is a joy to watch out there. He knows exactly how special it is that he's in the position he's in. I think that's awesome. One other thing to note, he looks like at the plate, like a Greg bird clone. Somebody. Yes, that picture. he does. So I thought that was kind of funny. Shout out Greg bird. Um, we got some rapid fire questions, one of which concerns Ben Rice. So from at NBYBB2, hashtag judge is the only MVP. We got, can we get Rice Rice baby shirts? And the answer is maybe. Keep an eye out. Crosstown Sports has some merch in the works. That's what I'll say. And there are some things that Whipple and I say on this podcast a lot. And if they end up on shirts, you shouldn't be surprised. That's where I'll leave that one. Love it. Another question from at. I can't even. There are too many consonants. I've been reading it as E.G. Kingston, but the at is like G K X N whatever. Anyway, the question is, what should the Yankees do with Torres if he continues to slump? My answer is I reject the premise from April 27th to the time the Yankees showed up in Boston. Glaber had 177 plate appearances with a 117 WRC plus. That's the guy he is. The reason you think he's slumping is either because of four games, which is too small a sample, or because it was dragged down from the beginning of the season, which I think was impacted by him getting hit in the hand in Houston. Glaber is still Glaber. I'm not worried about him. I don't know if you see it differently, Whipple, but the answer certainly is not Oswaldo Cabrera. It's certainly not Oswald Peraza. It's not obvious that there's an option on the trade market. I think Glaber Torres is more valuable to the Yankees than he is to anyone else, and I think he's more similar to the Glaber Torres we know and love than he's getting credit for in this question. Yeah, I mean, I agree partially. I think Glaber is still has kind of stalled out in June, and it really is a little still. It's still disappointing to me. I don't think he's all the way back, but at the same time, like he is by far and away the most valuable option at second base, and it doesn't take much for him to be playing like that. Like people don't realize like how sparse some of these infield positions are. It's especially a steep on the drop market. after that. It's a steep drop. So whatever you think about Glaber, just know that what he can produce at his best or even his average outcome is likely better than pretty much anything else out there and definitely better than Oswaldo Cabrera. So ongoing conversation about whether his season success or failure, not really an ongoing conversation of second baseman being a need for the Yankees in, in July, I think. From Ryan Garcia, would you rather know what it feels like to hit a ball 120 miles an hour or throw a ball 105 miles an hour? I feel like throw. I don't know. That would be like, I mean, I feel like most people would say hit. It's something about throwing a ball that fast, like knowing you physically have the power to do that. That's my answer. Yeah. The throw would be pretty cool. I'm trying to think like, I don't think it's a perfect analogy, but when I hit a golf ball as hard as I can hit a golf ball, I don't always feel like I did something remarkable, but I do think there would be something to throwing a ball that hard that, uh, you know, kind of adds something. Right. Um, from my best man, Gary Shore, at Gary Shore on Twitter, if Ben Rice teamed up with an animal that he can completely control but is his size or smaller, and to be clear, Ben Rice is 6'1", 215, what is the largest animal they can beat together in hand-to-hand -hand combat? So is this Ben Rice plus animal against other animal? <laughs> ben Rice plus animal against other animal, but Ben Rice has to be able to control the animal that... Or wait, can does you Ben Rice have to be able to control it? Or is Gary giving Ben Rice control? Let's say Ben Rice plus any animal under 200 pounds. I think Ben Rice plus a big dog can take down something really big. I, I, whatever you think, I really don't know. <laughs> I think this is a great question. I can't do I'm the gonna... animal questions. <laughs> okay. No more. I'm like Mike Francis. We're not doing animal questions today. <laughs> Andy Pettit is a starting pitcher. <laughs> Okay, folks. I think no. Ben Rice and a big dog could take down maybe a black bear. 
Gary, sure. I'll get back to you. Bro, are you an immaculate grid player, Whipple? Uh, not as much anymore, but occasionally. Okay, we got from Karambit R favorite immaculate grid to have done i like the ones where it's just it uh there's a column that's played minimum one game or like pitched minimum one game because that's when you get to use your adonis rosa your amori sanit uh your andrew brackman like those are those are the ones that really get me going you have any categories yeah. on immaculate grid you like I, I like the awards one because you always sure. find like there are people that won awards that you just like can pull out of your brain that no one ever knew. Um, that's my answer. Yeah, no, that's a good one. I like uh, Justin Dukeshire as an all star. He's one of my yeah. go tos with that. There that's was a good some one. Some crazy battle. Sneaky two time all star, by the way. Like 20 years ago, like height of the Sarah oh, era, some crazy yeah. bad pitcher all stars. Like oh, closers sure. with like 6.5 ERAs. Of like well, there was also the, is there still the one per team rule? Because that yeah. got some wild stuff. Um, Justin Dukesher, sneaky two-time all-star. Kosuke Fukudome had that awesome half season. He made an all-star team. Brian Lahair, another. Oh, great. wow. That's a good one. Okay, we're not getting into remember some guys. We got to wrap okay, this up. Okay. Whipple. Garrett Cole has just taken the mound for the New York Yankees. They are the best team in baseball currently. Everyone is kind of healthy, I guess. Judge isn't in the lineup, but he also isn't on the IL. What's your confidence, one to ten, in this team? Um, I kind of forget where I was last time, but I'm going to say nine point five, just because everything's clicking. Um, you know, whatever you want to think about hitting, pitching, I don't really care. Um. Garrett Cole's back like that's kind of where it starts and ends for me so it, it I don't know if they're playing well enough where it's like 10 where I don't have to worry about everything but that's really this is like hot you know these are first world problems here they're playing so well in the long term short term and Garrett Cole's back that's 9.5 because my favorite player is on the mound again and I, I just feel like he's gonna have a huge impact on the rest of the season I'm so excited to watch him and I'm so excited to keep watching the rest of this team. They're just a great group of players and every game I watch, I, I feel like more and more like this is just a very special team. Yeah, I'm with you. It's got to be 9.5 all on the back of Cole being back. Basically, even though Drudge is hurt, even though Glaber hasn't been real Glaber, you know, for a super sustained period of time quite yet. You know, I think there's, there's more there than what he's given. The fact that Cole is back and the Yankees could lose the last two games of the series and still be the top team in the AL East, I got to go 9.5. And that is where we're going to wrap this up. Whipple, any parting shots from you before we sign off? So two parting shots. One, I think I found the guy I was thinking of, and I need to like double check this on baseball reference. But do you remember? I have to check the ERA. Yeah. Okay. Do you remember Derek Turnbow? No. So Derek Turnbow, pitcher for the Milwaukee Brewers, was in 2006, was their closer and had 24 saves. And he did really well the year before, to be fair. It was like sub two ERA for the Brewers. Okay. In 2006, 24 saves. Um, and at the end of the season, his ERA in 56 innings was 6.87. And he was That's an all-star. That's amazing. And I know, I think the second half was like significantly worse, but even at the all-star break, his ERA was trending and it was like five. So there you go. That's like, that's some great, some, or uh, if you needed that for Immaculate Grid, he played for the Brewers. It all starts with over a six ERA. I love Derek that. Turnbow. That, sh also, that should be, that should be a category. Also, we got to just remember one guy, Willie Mays passed away yes. yesterday. One of the great players of all time, potentially the greatest. I think he's in the short list of guys you could say that for. Um, and we're not, it's not a Giants podcast, but you don't really need to be a Giants fan to respect that this is one of the last baseball icons of the 1950s and 60s um, that that has left us. And I think the coolest thing is that the Giants are playing at is it Rickwood Field this Rickwood week. Rickwood Field, yep. I think very fitting that that is going to happen in light of, you know, the passage of Willie Mays because his career basically started there. And just one of the baseball Titans, like it's, it's on that, that short list of, you know, three, four guys. And 
I think just such an impact in, in what he did for baseball in the field, but also just as a person, as a leader, um, as an African-American athlete. It's it's a loss that is is very sorely felt by all parts of baseball fandom. Yeah, absolutely. And I think Costas said on the broadcast last night something to the effect of, you know, this is one of the guys you'd be talking about if you had to narrow the Hall of Fame down to 10 people. And I think that's absolutely true. And I've, you, there's so much you can say about the life of Willie Mays and, you know, retiring as the guy with the second most home runs in baseball history. And the fact that at one point it was just Ruth Mantle or Ruth Mays and Mantle um, on that list. And one thing I always think about is just, Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle were at their peaks playing across the river from each other. And yeah. what an incredible time that might have, that must have been to be a baseball fan in New York City. So, absolutely, our condolences to the family of Willie Mays and to the broader baseball family. And uh, may he rest in peace. Well, Whipple, that wraps things up for episode 114 of the Yankees Files podcast. People can keep up with everything we do at yankeesfiles.com. They can keep up with us on Twitter, where we are at Yankees Files. Podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. We hope people will, of course, rate, review, subscribe, download, et cetera, et cetera. And if they like it, if they don't like it, we hope they'll just listen to it, juice those numbers, and not leave any negative feedback. The video version of the podcast is available on Spotify, and the whole video goes up as well on our YouTube channel. We're at youtube.com slash at Crosstown Sports. You can follow Crosstown Sports on Twitter at Crosstown SN as well. Whipple will be back at our normal time on Sunday or Monday of the coming week to recap the series that was against Baltimore and everything that goes on against Atlanta. Until then, let's go Yankees.